Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dave Maschke. I work for Ottawa Fire. Um, uh, about a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, I uh, went to Ottawa U and asked them if they would be able to help us out with some research on exposures. Um, so after some quite a bit of discussion and uh, work with uh, uh, Ottawa U, Dr. Jules Glenn and uh, Paul White from Health Canada, uh, we came up with a, a project that we thought would be very beneficial to the fire service in looking at exposures in real life uh, fire events, so actual incidents, and try and sample those incidents both pre and post, and try and determine what kind of things we're getting exposed to in live uh, fire incidents. Um, so I'm not going to belabor this too long, but. Uh, Dr. Ume Akhtar and uh, Jennifer Peer are the two researchers that took on this project and uh, they're here today to present to you some of the preliminary results. We aren't completely finished yet, but uh, um, they're going to present to you with some of the stuff that they found during their research. So, Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you to the Ottawa Fire Service for giving us the opportunity to work on the project. And um, I got the job because of this, um, this project, so thank you. And uh, thank you for those people who stayed uh, so long for listening to us. So you guys are hearing me at the back? Good? Okay, awesome. So uh, today we are going to talk about our study on the occupational exposure to toxic pollutants of firefighters. And this is a collaborating collaboration between Ottawa Fire Service, University of Ottawa, and um, um, Health Canada, sorry. And Dave Muskie, he has been a huge help for us. He has been our model, our guinea pig, our emergency helpline. So uh, thank you very much. So the objective of this study is to actually uh, look at firefighters' exposure to toxic pollutants during live fire events and also from secondary sources, for example, at fire station. Uh, there has been some studies that already done, but they have been done at the training facilities, not uh, at real fire events. And you already know, you know better than us, the, how the training facility center are different from a real fire scenario. Uh, there has been like a, I would say like three, four studies that looked at real fire incidents, like um, collected samples from them. But our study is the first one that looked at like the, at air that uh, like a, we collected some wipe samples from the PPE skin, so that and the uh, urine excretion. So you can see that we are going through the circle, like what's in the air, what's going through you, and what's going out. So this is the first kind of a study that that has done it. But today we are going to present like very preliminary um, uh, results. They are just like coming out from the lab. So uh, the conclusion we are. Um, saying today may be different what we are going to uh, submit at the final, uh, like the end of the year in fall to, the, uh, to our funding agency. So firefighters, they are um, exposed to uh, like a number of chemicals um, in, in a fire. So it's not possible to monitor all of the, of the chemicals. So we came up with the, like a two group of chemicals that we're going to look at. One is uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and another, another is like uh, some metals. Why do we choose these groups? Because the, both of these groups are known to be like a, in the year after a fire and they are known for their toxicity. The polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, there are like hundreds of them, but US EPA already has already um, like a pointed out 16 priority uh, pollute, uh, PAHs, so we are going to concentrate on them. And um, among the 16, uh, one is already known as carcinogenic, the benzopyrene, and there are seven others that has been um, like identified as pot potential carcinogenic. So you can see that like how bad they can be. And uh, some of the PHs, like benzopyrene, they are known as mutagens. So what mutagens does there is like the genetic mutation of exposed cells that can lead to cancer. So. That's why we're interested in these 16 uh, um, pHs. And then we are, uh, among the metals, we, we selected few of them, like cadmium, lead, antimony, and lead. So cadmium, they are, they are used to have, like a used to use as a, like a color pigments, and then um, like a, in plastics, and cadmium compounds. Um, so the, the cadmium and cadmium compounds are already identified as carcinogenic. Antimony, um, they are also used as a, like a color pigment in glass or like a, in plastics. 
And antimony trioxide is actually used as a flame retardant. So uh, an antimony trioxide is identified as a pot potential carcinogenic. Again, for lead and lead organic compounds, uh, they are potential carcinogenic, so we were uh, interested in these chemicals. So at the beginning of uh, like the last year, our project proposal that was reviewed and uh, be approved by the, um, the research scientific boards of um, University of Ottawa and Health Canada, and we knew like how appreciating the process was. But finally, we were done, and then we started um, recruiting the volunteer participants. The inclusion criteria was the participant has to be non-smoker, live with a non-smoker, and avoid uh, could be like a exposure to fire, like from like a restraining from eating barbecue or bonfire during the period of the study. And uh, all the participants they have to sign the, like a consent form and fill out a general questionnaire form at the beginning of the study. We had few like uh, Tom and Jerry moments, like running after the participants to get the form signed, but luckily there was only like two or three people. But we got that done. So at the final, finally, we had like 20 healthy male firefighters from four out of fire service stations. Um, there were like more people interested uh, from other stations too, but we really wanted to concentrate on the stations where we are going to do some air characterization too. So we wanted to recruit firefighters for only from those stations. So we um, we cut, we like we did three stations. And uh, the firefighters, they arranged like from 25 to 55 years and have been in the service for uh, like a half to 36 years. And um, we, we did the sampling for five shifts, 24 hour shifts. We tried to do five shifts in a row, but there has been some, like a, somebody took a vacation or something. So there has been some, uh, some changes. And we also had like 18 office workers from two auto fire service offices as a control. So at the beginning of the study, what we did is like we collected some um, like a urine sample from the uh, participant and then some um, skin wipe samples. So skin wipe samples were collected like from forehead, neck, and the wrist. So these are the places where we like uh, we think that uh, they will get more exposed to. And uh, we also did um, the sample collection. So these are like wipe collections. So we gave them wipe and they'll just wipe the space. And we did, uh, for the PPE, we collected the sample from jacket, the SCBA belt, and their pant. And the last sample was their undergear uh, sample. So whatever they wear um, under their PPE during a fire. So it could be their t-shirt and other pants. And I think this is the first study that looked at the personal clothing for firefighters. So when there is a, like a during a fire event, they go to a fire. So the only thing they had to do is like it, the tar take the like a, they already had a pump in their uh, pocket and the 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 cartridge you could see like in the back of their neck so that is already on their PPE so if there is a, like a fire call they'll hop in the truck they had to take that uh, the cap off and then turn on the pump that they had to do during a fire and do some air collection so after they come back from the fire they uh, do the wipe sampling again. So we do the, like, uh, the skin, the PPE, and their uh, undergear samples. They do that. So we have pre and post uh, samples. And for the urine, they collect all the urine for next 18 hours. And after that, they fill out a fire event questionnaire. So in the fire event questionnaire, we ask more information about the fire. For example, what was their role? what was the condition of the fire, so we could compare those uh, information with the uh, number we get. So that was our fire sampling stuff, and then this is our, like, uh, when we looked at the, 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 the secondary source characterization at uh, fire stations. So we uh, looked at the same uh, compounds, the pHs, 16 pHs, and the uh, three metals. We did, um, um, did some, like, a year of uh, collection at the vehicle barrier, uh, we used uh, like a like a high volume sampler, so you can eat like a raw like 480 liter per minute um, air. And then the second picture, you could see that like, uh, there is like a big uh, round filter where you, there was like a, all the particulate uh, matters deposited. And then we did uh, the air collection at the vehicle bay and inside the fire truck. So for inside the fire truck, we used the small pump because you cannot put the big pump there. And then, like <coughs> in between uh, sampling, they would be gone with the with the truck, which happened a few times. And as a reference location, we also did some air sampling at the office location. So to look at that, so um, these are some uh, results. Um, 
So this is a comparison between the office and the vehicle barrier. So the office, we had like three samples, and the vehicle barrier, we have nine. So I have combined all the uh, samples from three stations. So we collected three samples from each station. So the total number is nine. And um, you can see that like they have a letter on top of them. So if the letter is same, there is no statistically significant difference between them. Uh, so you can say that um, I can say that like 13 times higher vehicle bay that in the vehicle bay the total pages was 13 times higher than the office, and um, the the vehicle bay concentration was like uh, twice uh, the what you see like in typical urban area, so it's not that bad. And uh, there has been another study that was done in Portugal, which looked at like eight fire stations in their vehicle base, and each range from like a rural to urban stations. And um, your number kind of fall, like fall in between them. So if I introduce the fire track, you could see that like office kind of like vanishes, and um, like uh, the vehicle barrier. Okay, but fire track had almost like 20 times higher concentration than the vehicle barrier and it was like statistically significant. So before I talk, like go further, I want to talk about some occupational exposure limit. I'm sure you know about that. But those occupational exposure limits are normally available for eight hour shifts, but yours are cases like different. You are on 24 hour shift. And when you go like inside the fire truck, you are not there for 24 hours. You're there for like 30 minutes, sorry, like maybe a few minutes. And then at the fire, you know, it depends, right? So um, using an OSHA model, Occupational Safety and, uh, Safety and Health Association model, so the eight hour can be converted uh, to 24 hour using this simple calculation. And then for a short period of time, there is like another uh, limit that can be used, which is the discussion limit, which is just like a three times of the, of the occupational exposure limit. And it is um, recommended that you don't ex exceed that number once a day and should not be exposed to that concentration more than 30 minutes at a time. So if I compare that number to uh, what is I'm um, seeing at the vehicle bay and fire truck, you can see that like, a, for example, the total pH is um, for 24 hour, the, the standard is 66 and the vehicle bay is way below that. that. And for um, like inside a fire truck, I use the 30 minute standard, which is like 600 and yours are still way below that. So that's a good thing. This is uh, cadmium, so the same graph where I have the office, vehicle bay, and the fire truck. And um, the office was uh, surprisingly a little higher than the vehicle barrier, and the fire truck was like uh, 37 times higher than the vehicle barrier, but both, like, both of them were below the um, adjustable uh, occupational exposure limit. This is for antimony, so uh, vehicle barrier was a bit higher than the office, but uh, the fire truck was 44 times higher than the vehicle barrier, but below the, uh, the limit. And the same for the lead. Lead was also like uh, office was a little higher than the vehicle barrier, but fire truck was the highest, but everything was below the expo occupational exposure limit. So this is just uh, like a summary of the table of whatever like the air characterization we did at the fire station. So you can see that the, the, the total pHs, they were uh, higher than the metals, and, uh, but the metals were like way below the occupational exposure limit for 24 hours at the fire stations. So next we are going to talk about the firefighting samples. So um, we did the study from uh, February to October in 2015. But we took uh, like I think like two months break between like in summer because it was really hard to restrain people from eating barbecue or taking vacation. So <laughs> we thought we'll take a break during that and went back like in September. But I think like we were lucky that within that period we got like 31 fires. But here we are going to talk about like 29 pair sample for which we have pre and post samples for the urine, wives, and also matching. Uh, Air, uh, air samples. So these 29 uh, samples came from 19 fires. So there were some fires where we had like multiple, uh, multiple participants who went there. Unfortunately, not all the participants got fire, but there were like some participants who got like five, six fire. So uh, the t pHs, the total pHs are cadmium, whatever we measured. We are measured it at the, in their like personal air concentration. I'm calling it personal air concentration because 
like the concentration, like the sample was collected here, so it would be the concentration around their head or their upper torso. The sam this concentration could be different in the other location of the fire scenario. So you could see that like a, inside that cartridge, the, what, there is like a, the sleeve, there is this white thing, and there is like a, this small filter. So you can see that this is like a nice filter, white, not that bad. This is okay, but this is like the filter that gets us excited. We're like you, the, the bigger fire, the better it is, you know? So um, you can see that, yeah, some fire were really bad, but some were not that bad. So this is uh, the, the total pH concentration results from the uh, 29 fire events we have. And uh, I'd like to identify <coughs> that the, the y-axis here it's a log scale, so every um, increase is like a exponent, like a, a factor of ten, not like a linear one, two, three, four. So, so it just emphasizes on the small numbers too. So I can see that like uh, some numbers were low, some numbers were high, and there were a uh, couple of them which exceeded the 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 occupation exposure limit, like the excursion limit for thirty minutes, which was um, the short term like um, limit. So you can see that some of them really exceeded the, the concentration level. Uh, these are the, the air collection time for those fires. So um, you can see that in some uh, instance they were there for like 48 minutes, more than 30 minutes. But uh, the challenge with uh, like sampling with the real time scenario, the real fire incidents is that like we could not collect samples for the whole time. For example, the one we had 48 minutes, the, the participant was present there for four hours, but he did the collection for 48 minutes. So at the time he may be exposed to like a less or high concentration, we don't know, but we will have an idea when we look at the skin or wipe samples. So uh, that's a way to look at it. So this in incidence, yeah, it can go like, a, I think like it can cross that limit. But so the good news is like uh, the, the participants are not exposed to this concentration because they are using the SCBA. So they are not supposed to be exposed to this concentration. But the bad news is if they, uh, like, uh, if they prematurely remove the SCBA, like sometimes they go out and uh, to like uh, change the, the tank, they will remove the SCBA and get a new one. They can get exposed during that time because there will be like a lot of, of, of gassing from their gear. and. Um, also, uh, like if there's like a leak or anything, they can get uh, exposed to the concentration. This is the results uh, for our, uh, the cadmium. So uh, none of them really exceeded the limit, but it was close. And uh, same for the antimony, none of them crossed the limit. But uh, this is for uh, lead. Um, yeah, a few of them crossed the limit, but um, you just remember like you are wearing, if you're wearing the SCBA, you're not exposed to the, the concentration. So this was the, the, the air <coughs> concentration. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, wipe samples. So uh, this is for the total pHs. So the first one is for like the first two one is for um, clothing. So pre and post. The next one is for skin and uh, PPE. So if you see like a different letter between them, so they are like significantly different. Uh, so you can see that there was like a significant increase in skin and PPE, not that much in clothing. Uh, but uh, like in average, there was like a 15 to 16 times increase on the on the um, like the wipe from the wipe samples. But um, there were like some incidents where there was like a 150 or 190 fold increase in the total pHs on the skin or on the PPA. So there are some incidents that was really really high, but the average was still like very high. There was uh, there was like another study that looked at um, the this like a deposition on skin. And they found like before and after fire, there was like a four times increase. But this was done in a training facility fires. So this is there, like a year concentration. You could see that their number is like well below like a thousand, and ours is like way above the thousand. So that kind of like a tells you the story, like the difference between like doing a study in the real time, the real uh, fire incidents or in the training facilities. And we're think we are uh, suspecting that the, in, at the real fire scenarios, you are exposed to more uh, more of these um, compounds. Um, so for the cadmium, antimony, and lead, I just like uh, summed up all the numbers. Um, so for the total pHs, you could see that there was like a significant increase in skin and PPE. Uh, for cadmium, there was no significant increase, but for antimony and lead, it was like high for all of three of that, uh, like uh, um, like the personal clothing, skin, and PPE. 
So the personal clothing was not as bad as um, skin or PPE, but still there was like a, it was significant and skin was like almost the same as the PPE. So what could be the reason? It could be like the point, like the places we uh, choose this, the wrist and the neck, there could be those, the, the point of entry. And there has been some like, a, there was a, like interesting presentation this morning where uh, Greg showed that the particles can basically like penetrate through the, through the gloves or the, or the hood. So that's another way of exposure. And there is like another study that was done at Queensland Academy in Australia where they showed that the vapor also goes through the PPE. So uh, that's how the, the you, know, you can have like a whole body of exposure. Another way of exposure would be like the, the way you handle your PPE and the equipment afterwards. So you could, there could be like lots of out guessing or if you're not using your gloves, you can touch stuff. That's the way you can get exposed to. So I'm going to summarize um, what um, I said so far. Um, so um, the pHs and metal concentrations, they were like well below the adjustable occupation and exposure limit at the fire stations. And um, the ambient pHs and metal concentration exceeded the short time excursion limit at, the fire, at some fire scenarios. But <coughs> if you're using the SCBA, you may not exceeding that limit. And significant increases in post-fire post wipe samples were observed in this study. So I'm now going to hand it over to uh, Jennifer, who is going to talk about the urine samples and the conclusion. All right, so I had the glamorous job of collecting all the urine samples from ops workers and firefighters. Um, so this is essentially what I hear every time I walk into a fire station now. <laughs> um, so we, collect, we collected urine samples from office workers, which we use as controls. So these are people who are employed by the Ottawa Fire Service but aren't necessarily exposed to fires. Um, and then, as Selma had uh, explained, we took samples from firefighters before a fire and then for all 18 hours after a fire because we need that whole 18 hours afterwards because that's how long it takes to metabolize the chemicals that we're looking at. Um, so with these urine samples, I divided it into four portions. So the first portion, we looked at metals, so the same as uh, that we analyzed in air, so cadmium, antimony, and lead. The second one, we looked at pH metabolites, so as Dave will so beautifully show here. Uh, when you're exposed to pHs in the air, we won't measure pHs in the urine because your body metabolizes it. So after you breathe it in or it's exposed through your skin, your body metabolizes it and adds these little hydroxy groups. Oh, is that a laser? Oh, it does. So it adds these little hydroxy groups. So that's actually what we'll be measuring in the urine to be indicative of what, you, what parent pH you were exposed to. The third portion, we looked at biomarkers. So these are compounds you can find in your urine that are indicative of some sort of physiological condition. So the first one is called Claricel 16 or CC16. So when your lungs, if your lungs experience some sort of injury, uh, your lungs will excrete CC16 and it'll eventually come out in your urine. So we can measure that in urine to be indicative of lung injury. And the second one we looked at was 8-isoprostane. So this is a product of fatty acid peroxidation. In other words, it just looks at overall oxidative stress and cellular injury. And then the fourth portion we looked at is overall urinary mutagenicity. So again, as Selma had uh, explained, in smoke, there's thousands of different compounds. You can't analyze for them all. So we want to look at the overall mutagenic potency of that smoke exposure. So instead of analyzing all these separate compounds, we take, we take out the organic extract of the urine. So we take all those, organic all those organic metabolites out as a group, and then we expose it to a type of, a type of salmonella, salmonella YG1041. Um, and this, uh, this strain of salmonella has been modified so that it technically shouldn't be able to grow unless it's mutated. So you might get a couple that will spontaneously revert back and be growing where it shouldn't be. Um, however, if we expose the same type of salmonella to that group of mutagenic compounds, we see that it grows more up. You see more colonies growing than it, if it was not exposed to a group of mutagens. They're still growing. So uh, I'll be showing a few of these things are called box plots. So along the uh, y-axis or the vertical axis will be the concentration of the compound that we're looking at. And then we have Ottawa, uh, Ottawa fire office workers as our controls, and then firefighters before an event and firefighters after event. So what we found, this is looking at metals, we saw a significant increase in uh, urinary antimony after a fire. Uh, on average, it would increase fivefold. 
And this is interesting because the sample had mentioned the high amounts of antimony found in flame retardants. <coughs> Looking at those pH metabolites, yes? I don't understand this graph and I don't know if you'll be No, that's totally. Uh, can you just explain that? Explain what's going on? The bars in the box. Yep, absolutely. I'm glad you reminded me. I meant to say that. So these are kind of, they're kind of like bar graphs. So on the middle line, that's the average. Um, okay. And then the boxes and the whiskers, so the lines, those are just showing the distribution of all the samples. So these are all the samples plotted together. So you have the average along here. This yeah. is the 25th percentile. This is the 75th percentile. Okay. And then this is like the minimum and the maximum. So what's important to look at is the average. So that's about a five-fold increase. But you can see that there's such variation between all the samples. Does that make sense to everyone? Uh, so then looking at the pH metabolites, so again, we see these beautiful box plots. Um, and as Selma had uh, suggested or uh, said before, the different letters on the different boxes show that they're significantly different. So um, here we, also, we have our controls as the Ottawa um, fire office workers, but I also took data from a study that looked at non-smoking Canadian males and I took out the ones that were around the same age as the firefighters that we sampled here. So you can see that uh, the non-smoking Canadian males from just the general population um, are significantly lower. This is looking at the metabolites of pyrene, so pyrene's a pH. So they're significantly lower than uh, Ottawa, the office workers as well as firefighters before an event. And then we see a significant increase in firefighters after an event. So this is about fourfold. And we see it's, oh, so, so if we overlay uh, the recommended guidance value for occupational exposures using hydroxypyrene, because this is the 25th percentile of our after sample, that means that about 75% of firefighters after a fire are above this recommended occupational exposure limit. So some of the other pHs we looked at, so the, these are the metabolites of phenanthrene. So this is phenanthrene. These are all the different places that your body will snag on an alcohol group or uh, hydroxy groups that you can urinate it out. Um, and again, we see a significant increase in firefighters after a fire. This is about fivefold. And then again, this is another pH. This is called naphthalene. Um, so the Canadian population was significantly lower than all the other OFS workers. And again, we see a significant increase after a fire. This was about threefold. And again, for the metabolites of fluorine up here, uh, significant increase after a fire, about fourfold. And then looking at that overall ur urinary mutagenicity or the mutagenic potency of that complex mixture of mutagens that you may be exposed to at a fire, we see, we see a significant increase in firefighters after a fire, about fourfold. Um, so they did a study, actually one of my coworkers did a study looking at uh, the urine of Guatemalan children who uh, sit in these smoke houses. So these are individuals that sit in these smoke houses for about an hour, no PPE obviously, just breathing in uh, wood smoke. And the, the, the rate of increase that we saw in the firefighters is about two and a half times higher than these individuals who are sitting in these smoke houses just breathing in pure wood smoke. So granted you have to kind of take that with a grain of salt because the dose that these individuals are experiencing isn't nearly as high as what you would experience at a fire during fire suppression, um, but still interesting to note. We didn't see any uh, differences in the biomarkers. So the first one looking at lung injury, CC16, we didn't see any significant, significant changes between office workers and firefighters before and after an event. So this may be saying, or may be showing that firefighters um, are effectively reducing their respiratory exposures by using their SCBA. And then also looking at overall oxidative stress, we didn't see any significant uh, changes. Now this may, be, uh, this may be due to the fact that to produce A-disoprostane, which is the compound that we're looking here, looking at here, um, if you're engaging in hev heavy physical contact, you don't produce it um, at the same rate. So that may be affecting some of these results. So now we want to investigate you know, when we look at those box plots, there's such a range of values that we're seeing. So we want to figure out why one individual's exposure may be different than um, someone else's. So not surprisingly, the amount of time you spend at a fire, um, so the longer time you spend at a fire, the more urinary pH metabolites we see. So I took one of the graphs. So here I plotted the length of time that they're at the fire, and then the increase, and for the, this case, I just looked at the metabolite of phenanthrene. So then here we have the increase of phenanthrene. So you can see, um, the longer you're at a fire, the higher the increase in your excretion of urinary metabolites of uh, phenanthrene. 
But we see in the top right corner, if I can highlight it, oh, so we also saw similar patterns in the other pHs, pyrene, fluorine, and uh, naphthalene. So you see this individual in the top right who is at a fire for about the same amount of time as this guy, but why does he have such a notable increase in his pHs versus someone else? So for this individual, number uh, 411, he was at a multi-unit commercial fire. It was the only fire to report all colors of smoke. It was black, green, brown, white. Um, he reported very heavy smoke, and it was, one of the, it was the third largest fire that we sampled at uh, um, in the study. So if we take out this outlier and kind of zoom in on what's going on down here, we again see We again see this group of individuals who were at a fire for about the same time as some of the, uh, their coworkers, but have this notable higher increase in uh, their urinary metabolite. So some similarities between these three individuals, uh, the fires that they went to will, were fully developed upon arrival. They had heavy smoke pushing from the structure of the object, and their role in fire suppression was uh, interior attack. So if you look at these indiv individuals separately, so ID number 720, he didn't have his SC SCBA on the whole time due to time constraints. So maybe he had above average exposure through his respiratory tract. Um, 285, it was the second fire of his shift, so he may be experiencing residual um, exposures from the first fire he was at. And then 635, again, it was the second fire, but he was also using a chainsaw, so maybe some of the off-gassing from the gas uh, chainsaw may have increased his exposure to PAHs. Another, so we see that the length of time they spend at a fire, we see an increase in their uh, urinary pH metabolite excretion. And again, not surprising, uh, the higher amounts of pHs we found from their personal air, the higher pHs, the higher concentration of pH metabolites we saw afterwards. So what we're looking at in the next steps of the project, because as uh, David mentioned, we're not fully finished yet, we want to look at the role in fire suppression, we also want to look at the nature of the fire, uh, what was on fire, what were the conditions that day, um, and kind of pick apart different people's exposures and their level of exposure. So in, conclu in conclusion, firefighters, um, firefighting activities are empirically associated with a significant increase in exposure to PHs, antimony, and mutagenic substances. Uh, we have additional analyses going on to scrutinize the influence of other variables. So as I said, the role in the fire attack, the nature of the fire. Um, where, as Selma had mentioned, uh, firefighters experience secondary exposures to PHs and metals uh, while inside fire trucks. And the lack of change in lung injury biomarker may suggest that uh, the route of exposure isn't fully through the respiratory tract, but maybe, maybe we should focus more on what's happening dermally. And uh, we're currently investigating some of the empirical relationships between the urine data, um, as well as the personal air collected from the fire or from, uh, yeah, from the fire, and also the different wipes, so from the skin, um, skin wipes, clothing wipes, and PPE wipes. So overall, we have an improved understanding of firefighters' occupational exposures, um, which will hopefully in the future lead to the development of policies and procedures that can reduce these exposures. So we'd like to thank uh, the Ontario Ministry of Labor for funding this, as well as the Ottawa Fire Service, who's been nothing but fantastic through this whole process, notably uh, Dave Matchkey, and then all of our collaborators, and our other funding sources, uh, Health Canada, University of Ottawa, and the Create React program.